Christine Schneider, the visceral voice. Welcome to season two of the Visceral Voice podcast. I'm your host, Christine Schneider. Every week on this podcast, I talk with voice specialists, manual therapists, health specialists, psychotherapists, movement practitioners, and professional voice users about voice science, function, medication, movement, puberty, and aging, and everything in between. I am on a quest not only to become a better manual therapist, but also to learn everything I can about the living, breathing body and its intricate connection to the voice. This podcast documents the continuation of my learning and my experience as a professional singer, a nutritional consultant, and a manual therapist. Join me every week as we strive to provide Provide current, knowledgeable, creative, and compassionate information to help restore, regain, and create happiness and success on your vocal journey. In 2004, Sherry Sanders created an audition class in New York City called Rock the Audition, a masterclass in auditioning for rock musicals. Since then, Sherry has become a published author and has taught at more than 84 musical theater programs all over the country to successfully interpret all styles of popular music. Sherry is the world's preeminent rock repertoire coach and audition cut arranger and is now the first person in the history of music theater to have audition cuts on the most popular sheet music site in the world, Music Notes. She is an amazing performer and entrepreneur. I am sure that most of the listeners know who Sherry Sanders is. If not, I am so thrilled that you're able to hear her on this episode. I am stoked to bring you my conversation with the vibrant and electric Sherry Sanders. Hi, Sherry. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, Christine, thank you so much for having me. I'm a huge fan of yours. I'm a huge fan of yours. So I cannot believe I'm very, very excited to have the Queen of Rock on the podcast today. Oh, my God. Thank you. Thank you for calling me that. That's very cool. That's very cool. So Sherry, in 2004, you created an audition class in New York City called Rock the Audition, a masterclass in auditioning for rock musicals. And it became a cult hit. Ah. (laughs) Can you tell us what led you to create this much needed class? Yeah. And I talk about this in my book and I talk about this very openly, but I actually had undiagnosed PTSD at the time. I got diagnosed actually six years ago, but I was sabotaging myself as an actress. And so I, I was up for all these Broadway shows, like down to the nitty gritty, but I I kept like short circuiting when I would get to the final moments and I didn't know how to control it. I didn't know how to make it go away. I was in therapy. And so my very, very big agent and all the very, very big casting directors got very, very frustrated with me. And at the time I was dating somebody who said, you know, who was a teacher and she said, well, if you teach, you can't sabotage yourself. So why don't you become a teacher? You're so good at pop rock music. And so I was like, sure. Well, I don't want to sabotage myself and it's not going away. So (laughs) I I guess I'll become a teacher. And then I became a teacher. and I was like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. Like I didn't even know that I could be in service Mm. in this way and with my talent and to create, and I created something that was totally unique to, to the size of the talent and the quality of the talent that people were calling me back for all these Broadway shows for, it was just coming through a different channel or a different branch of the same channel. So um, that's kind of how that started. And then I got formally diagnosed six years ago and I've been in treatment since then. So I became a teacher to let my talent come through in a way that was going to be, you know, unencumbered, un- untouched. And in the meanwhile, I found that I was able to create space eventually to work on what was happening in the car that was making it stall. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I created a kind of a great kind of cool healing environment for the community, which was like, you don't know how to do pop rock. I do. I'm safe. Get in here and let's play. And then in the meanwhile, I ended up creating a place for me to heal as well. So it kind of turned into, it turned into a bunch of things I didn't know it was going to turn into, but that's kind of how it started. It was that I couldn't, my talent couldn't come through. So I found a, another way to, for it to come through. That is so awesome. Thank you. So- <laughs> And I'm just going to kind of segue for a minute because you have ways to come to your Rock the Audition classes in person and you have an online program. I do. Is that correct? Uh, you can study with me in the city. Uh, you know, w- when you take the online program or when you sign up for the online program, we call that the on-demand program. That program is where I teach actors in the city 
private voice teachers, uh, actors in different cities and whole universities from. So I have like a core training program that's online and I have people study from that online Mm. program and then they come work with me in the city or they come work with me online or I go to Chicago and they work with me there. So I do have a core training program for people who, you know, can't make it to the city or can't see me for privates or people who actually are teachers at universities who want to train. So I kind of made it so that everybody had a way to play with me in whatever way they needed to. But online has been great because then I've been able to reach people who I couldn't normally reach. And it's been really wonderful because I started working online with people four years ago and it was really before anybody was on Zoom or those kinds of coaching. So um, I'm glad to see that it's become fertile, not just for me, but for other people. Yeah. Great. You have taught masterclasses in more than 84 music theater schools all over the country. What would you say are the most positive aspects that come out of these sessions, both for you and for the students? Oh my God, so much. Oh, it's hard hard to even (laughs) say because I train teachers, I train professional musical theater performers, I train college students, and now I'm training teens. I would say the biggest thing that's come out of it is that in the current cultural climate, everybody's kind of gotten traumatized to a certain extent or stunted in terms of their growth as artists. And that's showing up in teaching, that's showing up in performing, that's showing up in, sh- in actual productions and shows and just in people in general. So what I've enjoyed is that popular music gives people an opportunity to express their feelings about their own life. Mm. So like when I'm training a teacher, a teacher is singing popular music to learn how to live it viscerally to teach it. So that teacher then can go, oh my God, I haven't been in my feelings in 20 years. I've been teaching everybody how to book jobs. So the teachers get to have their feelings and the college kids get to go like, oh my God, I'm not playing a role. I'm playing myself. Well, this is how I feel about being bullied. You know, so like what I'm finding is that the magic that happens is that we get to address race issues, gender issues, any cultural issues, issues of any kind of diversity. I I get to work with people who are are neurodivergent. I just get to work with people in a space where they don't get to go. And so it's been thrilling for me because I feel like I hold space for great things. Great things happen and we all get better. So it almost feels like I get to be that cool aunt that comes in and shakes the house up and smoke cigarettes and talks about sex. And then everybody has a a wild, wonderful time, a wild ride. So do I. And then I get to move, leave, leave. So in a way it, it electrifies the places that I go and it also electrifies my own spirit. So because we're not talking about roles and shows, we're talking about humanity and feelings and emotion and things we push away and things that we don't get to address because we're addicted to social media. So I kind of pull everybody away from that stuff and get them with themselves. Mm. And I get with myself too. It's really nice. Yeah. I'm sure any of the listeners who happen to not know you, because I know <laughs> many, many people know you, but obviously you can hear that Jerry is very electric. <laughs> you are and- too. In your teaching and in your performing and in your life, you are incredible at helping those around you and your students at finding what makes them unique. How do you go about bringing this into the work as an artist? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting because, uh, Christine, you ask great questions. First of all, thank you. (laughs) You know, when I first got into this idea of like teaching people pop rock, it was like making sure that they can live in a world that is not traditional musical theater. But then as I started looking at the different eras that musical theater lives in, or or pop rock musical theater lives in and popular music lives in, you realize that there's something emotional in each style that kind of requires you to check in with a certain part of yourself. So if we're talking about the 50s and 60s, it's actually like, I'm, and I'm saying this with love and respect to everybody because I am a white girl myself, but you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of the activism I do is around sort of letting people of color have, we need to sort of create more of a level playing field in terms of auditioning for things. So some of us white girls have to back up and <laughs> let people of color have roles that we've been have, let, getting to take, right? So But it's amazing because to me, then I get to teach people who are Caucasian to come into an audition room and integrate when they sing a 50s and 60s song. So it makes you become an activist. It makes you actually engage in activism when you're singing. And it asks you to tap into your feelings about race. And that asks you to tap in as a white person, as a black person, as a mixed person, as an Asian person. And so what what I found is that all of these different styles that I teach actually hold a space for some soul searching and for some depth of work. And we end up finding out that people actually, when they go to school, 
then they learn to play roles and characters. They don't learn how to be themselves. And so in that, I think these different styles of music give people an opportunity to ask themselves who they are and how they feel about things. And in that, their uniqueness comes out because how music lives in me and how music lives in you, even if we're both living in 1964, has some similarities in that, like, for example, the dance moves are the same. We're doing the twist and the Watusi, right? And maybe we are both Caucasian and we both want to appreciate Stevie Wonder and the Stevie Wonder song we're dancing to. But at the same time, we do come from different houses and different backgrounds and our families are different and the music that we listen to is different and our relationship to race may even look different and what the song means to us might look different. So that's where it is, is that, you know, I ask people to, to use history and their own personal emotion to create a point of view that's unique to them. And I find that once you give them that sort of combination of researching and soul searching, I have a hashtag called research soul search, (laughs) that kind of setting combination brings unbelievable stuff out of people when you know, no, you got to create a character that's based on yourself. So go see what the world was like and go think of yourself in that world. And then all the details, like all the details just come right away. And so that way it's not about type anymore. It's about how does the music affect you? And how do you live in the world of the 50s and 60s or the 80s or punk or hip hop or whatever? So the individuality comes from those two details. And I tend to find people tapping into or at least feeling safe to tap into places that were shut by their teachers prior to this or told that they weren't allowed to do that or that that wasn't correct or no, they're not the right body type for that or no, they're black. They should only sing black songs or you're white or you should only sing white songs. So like kind of like opens up the span of uh, emotional expression just by saying popular music is open for interpretation. So start interpreting. (laughs) That's how people come. And that's how the coolest things come out of people. Yeah. I love that. Thank Being you. yourself, walking in the room as yourself. Walking in the room as yourself with detail. Knowing who you are. Yeah, knowing who you are and knowing who you are in relationship to the details of the world that the music is in. Those two things tell everybody everything and tell you about yourself. It makes people cooler when you research the music that came before the stuff you listen to. It just gives you uh, empathy, consciousness, detail, and uh, more to bring into it. More to bring, certainly more to bring into an audition room. Or rehearsal Definitely. Space. Yeah. Yeah. Each person has a different life to bring. Yep. Exactly. I love mm-hmm. that. I love that you said that. Thank you. But we got to go back into our lives. We got to go into our lives before our teachers took our impulses away from us. And I'm not saying all teachers do that. I'm saying a lot of conservatory programs do because they want you to book. But back into the, the self that was before it started getting taken away to fit a role or a mm. type. Go back in, go get it. <laughs> go get yourself. Yeah. Or get yourself for the first time. Maybe no one's ever let you be yourself, <laughs> but now's the time. Yes. Ask me more juicy questions. I love them. <laughs> so you're the world's preeminent rock repertoire coach and audition cut arranger. Yeah. Well, how did this happen? <laughs> well, um, I uh, have been arranging and cutting and picking music notes music for years and years and years and years and years. And what would happen is I'd be a repertoire coach where people would come and sing for me. And I'd be like, oh, you're a legit soprano. So you shouldn't be singing Pink. You should be singing Olivia Newton-John or you should be singing Celine Dion. It's just knowing that there are certain voice types that have certain qualities and we have to figure out whose voices fit what qualities in popular music and it was hard because a lot of people just think that pop rock is high belting screaming screlting high notes and it actually that there's only one or two styles that have that like punk and 80s pop rock everything else is 100 style mm. so to me i just became somebody who started really listening to people intuiting people and then finding songs that felt like their voice would match it right now and that if they studied popular music their voices could grow inside of that those songs so I started actually with music notes music. Well, for really, I started with like the Lincoln Center Library. If we're going to like go back in time, <laughs> it started there. Then music notes happened. And then I made a pit stop at a really, really bad experience with somebody who was making a website for arranging my music, but they were not uh, built for human consumption. So we, mm. I, mo- I immediately, I left, I walked out and I called music notes the next day. And I said, here's a couple samples of how I arrange. I've been arranging your music since whenever. And by the end of the week, I had a job at Music Notes, and now we have 700 cuts up now of pop rock songs. And then they've actually recently asked me to do traditional musical theater as well. So I'm actually going to take all of the great songs um, that we love, find the best arrangement of them, the best arrangements of all the traditional ones. Because, you know, like, I love Music Notes. They're my adoptive parents. 
but their arrangements are not what we love in terms of their uh, accuracy. So Mm -hmm. that's why I'm there for pop rock, but they want me there for traditional musical theater too. So I'm I'm even going to expand rock the audition to traditional musical theater training as well. So it's kind of been really amazing that Music Notes has sort of opened the door for me to expand my work into what I do as a performer, which is traditional musical theater. So I'm like a traditional musical theater performer, but a pop rock coach. (laughs) Yes. So what are some ways that auditioning for pop rock musicals differ from auditioning for traditional music theater? Another great question. Well, to me, there's two kind of base ones, really, really, really simple differences that I think are kind of mind blowing, but they're so simple. The first one is we're not singing to somebody, we're singing about somebody. So this is that person is not mm-hmm. here. So even if you're saying you, I'm having feelings about you, they're not here. If they were here, you wouldn't be singing this song to them. <laughs> this is you alone in your room after they abandoned you. So therefore, because they're not here, you have more room and a bigger palette of paints to paint your feelings with because you're not managing them or handling them or negotiating them. So that to me is one huge fundamental difference, which is that Mm -hmm. it's not a scene. It's your emotional part of the relationship. It's what that person did to you. It's how this person made you feel. You know what I mean? So yes, they exist. They're just not a nego- a nego- it's not a negotiation moment. It's 100% after you're alone and what you're left with. And I think that that seems to be sort of what separates the, for lack of a better term, because I don't like gendering anything, but it separates the boys from the men or the mice from the men. I don't know. It separates the successful ones from the unsuccessful auditions, mm-hmm. which is the minute you start making it a scene, it's a musical theater interpretation and not a pop rock interpretation and they're out. I would say that's one. Two, in traditional musical theater, you don't hear the music. It's your subconscious. You're not in a relationship with it unless you're in a scene in like the Kit Kat Club and you're in a jazz club and you hear the jazz music. You're not supposed to hear it. In popular music, the music is your scene part. That is your scene partner, (laughs) is the music. And you are in a relationship with the music. You hear it, you feel it, it affects you, you move it. It's it is a an ongoing, ever evolving spiritual connection. And so you, to me, hearing the music and relating to the music and letting the music be a part of your emotional expression is a necessity. So but those two things, hearing the music and knowing that you're alone and it is a you know, unless you're singing a disco song at a disco and you're like, Yes, Queens, get on this dance floor with me and dance. <laughs> it's just not to a person yeah that person is not valuable in this moment your your emotions are so those i would say were the two big things that i would want your listeners to know that's so great (laughs) you're great really helpful so what are the most common challenges you see students have when they first start singing rock music (sighs) that's a multifaceted question I'm sure. So the first common challenge is they think that rock music is screaming. So let's get back to that. Yeah. That that a lot of singers think that in order to be competitive in the audition room, you have to screll high cues and riff everything. That problem came from all of those awesome videos of all of our friends singing at 54 Below and like reinterpreting music and doing concerts is that you know, this is a 54 below. It's after hours. It's not an audition. It's a concert. Everybody's trashed and we're going for broke. And for some reason, because those are so great and so popular and people watch it, there is a, less of a distinction of understanding that that is not what we want in the actual audition room. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think it's when singers go right for trying to impress with vocals and actually not coming into the room with taste and appropriateness and, you know, sort of understanding the aesthetic of the audition room. So I think that that is a huge, huge, huge thing. It's like, yes, isn't that wonderful? I love riffing also. I love being trashed at the bar and singing and singing and singing. (laughs) But it is a different animal. And so I think if we can get people to know that vocals are one piece of a puzzle, and that puzzle is the synthesis between the voice and the body and the emotion, and that that synthesis needs to live in a particular style and have the style's sensibility, the show's sensibility, the music's sensibility. You can't add in all that extra stuff without it being connected emotionally to the world of the music. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that that to me is the biggest thing is that I wish that that continental divide between what people think is competitive and what is really competitive, which is a, a respect and regard for the style. Yeah. That, that to me is sort of the biggest one I've found that if people can know, know that is not, I know that's what I want to go to. I can do that in my house when I'm drinking my boxed wine and having fun. <laughs> but when I bring it into the audition room, I have to sort of reinterpret it to fit the aesthetic of the show I'm auditioning for and the audience who's looking at me, which is the producers of the show and the director and the casting director. So that I think is the thing I'd want to tell people is go back to the basics of traditional musical understanding and bring your fresh contemporary perspective to it. We're not auditioning for the voice. Yeah. Back to basics. Back to basics. We're auditioning for a musical. And I just have to know that when you're auditioning for this musical, you understand the style and that I can picture you in the cafeteria scene. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Great. What are three things that you wish every singer could know about singing rock music? That it's emotional and that I want your feelings. That's, I would say, first and foremost, that I would want people to know that Riffing isn't an emotion. Mm-hmm. Emotion is emotion. Riffing is the channel through which your emotions come. So I would say the first thing that I would want people to know is that it's an inside job and that you've got to get in touch with your feelings first and let your, let your feelings travel on your voice rather than having it be all about your vocals. So one, it's emotional. Two, so much of it is about effect and not effort, meaning... I don't want you to come into an audition and go for broke. We want to hear a song, a voice that could handle eight shows a week, no matter what style it is. So it's a stunning combination of technique and emotion. We don't want you to put your technique, throw your technique away. You want to think of it like your technique is a dish that's cooking on the left burner on low Mm -hmm. and that you want to turn the other dish that is your emotion cooking up on high and they're both cooking at the same time. So it's like, I will never, ever tell you to take your technique away, but sometimes I want you to actually just put it to the side and trust it and get emotional with me so your technique can do its job. Mm -hmm. So knowing the technique and emotion go hand in hand is huge because a lot of people will sing and I'll be like, that was perfect. I have no idea how you feel. Mm. And everybody's thinking, oh my God, how do I place this? How do I place this? You know, where do I place it? Do I place it in my head voice? And I'm like watching people place their music and I'm like, If you're just connected emotionally, it's going to place itself. I believe that that is the truth. So I think if we can just know that you have to be emotional, that the emotions and the voice are two dishes cooking on two burners, the emotion on high and the vocals on low and and the technique on low, still cooking. Don't push. Pull us in. I want the effect of the 50s and 60s. Give me the effect. That means I want you to like sound like you're in the 50s and 60s and give me the quality of What a lot of people think is I have to give you the effort, which means that when, like, for example, if you're singing like, here I go again or whatever, that's from the 80s, you're doing an 80s pop rock song. I want you to like act like you're putting effort in as opposed to really putting effort in. We just want a quality. So that's the, that's the third message is you want to capture the essence of a style or the quality of a style. We're looking for essence, quality, vibe. As opposed to clobbering us over the head with an anvil with the vocals. That's the third thing I would say. Yeah. Great. So we had number one was the inside job, the emotion, wanting that feeling. Two was the effect, not the effort. We don't need more effort. We want to have the effect of that genre. And then three was that quality, that essence, the vibe of the style. Well, yeah. And the idea that that the technique does not go away. The technique stays there and it cooks on low and you turn the emotion up on high and you trust your technique when you're being emotional as opposed to throwing your technique away to be emotional. Yeah. It's these things that to me, if the singer remembers that, they're automatically going to now end up in another tier of auditioning quality, which is I get that popular music does not need to be screamed. It needs to be felt and understood. And I, you need the quality and the essence of the era or the style, not screlting high cues. We want dynamic audition cuts, which is why I make them. We want an audition cut that has your range in it, but leave that to the audition cut. <laughs> Let the audition cut do the work. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. In this season, I'm starting a mini episode every midweek yeah. of Artist of the Week. So I've been listening to a lot of singer-songwriters' work. And this has been very true in that too. And I'll listen and I'm like, I just want you to feel. I want to hear you say something to me. Yeah. I want to listen to this. I want to be brought to the same place. I want to wow. feel with you. I want to understand what's happening. And so this goes hand in hand with what I've been hearing with different recordings too. Well, that's the thing is, is that we just want to connect. We need to connect. Social yeah. media has separated us and music in the way that the songwriters are or the way these hopefully new writers, musical theater writers are, you know, I don't know if you got to see a show called The Strange Loop. It is so special. But there are some musicals now that are actually going, I need you to meet me here. And there's this whole idea of bringing people to you and into your experience mm -hmm. that I think is what you're saying about these songwriters that, that you're talking about and working with, which is that we need intimacy again. And we've got to figure out how to get with yeah. people. And if we can get to them with our music or the way we share our music, that's awesome. If we could get to it the way we're emotional in our music, that's even better. If we could write a show that's about what's really happening and hold space for everybody who's in it and everybody who's, who's watching it to heal together, that's also cool too. But no, I mean, we're in a very dangerous environment and we need music right now to connect us to ourselves mm -hmm. and other people or we're just going to isolate and continue to, to reject showing up in the world and connecting to people. That's what I've noticed yeah. with performers teaching in the last year is that the current climate has made people not want to show up. Mm. They'll show up in body. They'll go to eight auditions, but are they really showing up in any of them? They'll go, well, I made, did, I, I did eight auditions this week. I, I nailed it. I did eight auditions. It's like, well, how did you, did you show up in them? Did you take risks in them? Did you risk everything emotionally? Did you study the styles? Mm. Did you do the homework on the shows? These things are where we can show up for ourselves and end up getting rewarded with, hey, that was awesome. I loved that song. I want you in the show. <laughs> you know, that's where we get, we get rewarded when we do the homework. We get not responded to when we don't. And the homework is, i.e., getting with yourself, getting the information about the show, getting the information about the music, and then getting with yourself and then sharing that self that you got with, with other people. And through doing that, you are not so isolated. No, you are not. You become somebody who shares. You become yeah. generous. You go into the room and you're like, hey, I'm Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> Here's me sharing a great song with you. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Like, I love it. You know? And then it brings you out in the world. But yeah, I do. I think that we have become scared to share. Mm. And I think par partially that is because look how we're sharing. We're sharing on social media as our personas. Mm -hmm. I have a persona. My persona is super positive, right? I'm a really positive yeah. person on social media. I'm an ally and an advocate. Every once in a while, I will share something about my PTSD, but I share it in a way that, it's, that is purposeful, meaning I share these things because I'm creating community. I'm creating a community of people that can study together and heal together. That's my purpose. That's what I want. And when I get likes, I, I, I like it. I like getting likes. I like getting responded to. I like more viewer, viewership. It's all good for me. That's for me that for a business, but because people have to be their own businesses mm -hmm. for the industry and people also have to be popular because we have to work and we have to be liked. Now we're posting not our authentic selves, but an interpretation of ourselves that, we're gar that will garner likes and garner mm -hmm. responses. And then when we get responses, it sets off um, like stimulus in our brain and it feels like a drug that stimulates us and we get turned, like our brains get turned on when people respond positively to us. So we're no longer really showing up in the world as ourselves. We're showing up in the world as a facsimile thereof or an interpretation of that it will get positive responses right? where we don't get them in the audition room. So there's a disconnect happening. And to me, where what I would say is that what I'd encourage is that everybody get into some kind of personal work while they're in this industry. And that could be therapy, that could be meditation, that could be medication and meditation and therapy. That could be, well, oh my God, there's just so many ways that one, that one could get with themselves. But volunteer work, finding things out that, you know, that could be a part-time job that are stimulating emotionally, you know, these kind of travel, uh, these kind of things are really, really great to sort of keep you connected to the self so mm -hmm. you don't get stuck 
leaving yourself behind and coming forward as an alternative self that is not going to, that is not going to receive likes in the audition room because it's not you. (laughs) You have to come into the room as the part of yourself that is tricky and hard and struggles and is also amazing, but in a way that we see you as opposed to a way that you protect yourself. So I think that's the other thing is that I would suggest people find whatever ways you can to get with your authentic self and know that that's a separate self from what you've been doing on social media. And that's sep- the separate self, the private self, the self you don't want people to see is the self we, that's who we want to see in the audition room. Just put it in the, put it in your craft. <laughs> yeah. This is all so amazing. To the listeners right now, I want to say that uh, Stephen Porges, his theory, polyvagal theory, Sherry's actually talking a that's lot talking about, about that right now. Now, if we're isolated, if our safety is threatened, if we're feeling threatened, which yeah. because we've gotten to a state in our lives where communication isn't just words, it's actually only 7% words. Right. It's, wow. it's also body language and facial expression and intonation. And because we've gone from communicating in a room with someone being able to see everything and taking that. And all of a sudden we went to phones where body language and facial expression was lost. Mm -hmm. And then we went from that to texting and emailing and social media where the only thing that we actually have on those is words, which is only 7% of our communication. Right. And then we've narrowed down our emotional expression. It's almost like it turns us into one dimensional people as opposed to two or three dimensional people. Right. It takes the other dimensions out and therefore we're not that thing anymore. We're just what we post. (laughs) Yeah. And then we get visceral reactions and we we respond to the, so it's, oh, no one's liked this or, oh, it's taken 10 minutes for someone to text me back and you feel it. Yeah. And we get defensive. Yes. As opposed to, oh, okay, that person is teaching a lesson right now and won't be done for the next hour. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've lost the sort of humanity of conscious exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also the immediate, the immediate need for connection for, for communication. It's like, if somebody doesn't respond to you right away, you're like you said, you go right into your brain and go, why aren't they responding? What's the matter? When Mm -hmm. we used to like have to respond by smoke signals. (laughs) <laughs> that you would hear from people in four months from after you send a smoke signal and you'd have to be okay for those four months. I mean, I'm being extreme, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So the audition room is where you need to say, hey, I went in here. I went into this rough place. I worked with a coach and crafted a great way to be in my emotions with this thing or be in the style with this thing. And I'm so excited to share it with you today. That's how it's got to go. Um, as opposed to, oh, there's an audition tomorrow morning for bop, bop, bop. Well, I, they're asking for a pop rock song. I guess I'll sing Heartbreaker. And then there's like no energy, no caring, no detail, no nothing. Then they go, oh, yeah, I didn't get a call back. They probably have cast it already. And it's like, I mean, you can be in that conversation with yourself or you could be in a conversation with how am I doing with my art? How did I do today? Did I do the homework? Yeah, I felt like I really got that punk vibe they were asking for because I tapped into my anxiety, (laughs) you know, as opposed to Mm -hmm. kind of just doing it, not knowing why you didn't get a response and, and assuming it's something outside of yourself when you can completely just focus on your own process that is completely inside of yourself and improve your craft. So I think that the improvement of the craft is also where your emotional access is. Yeah. Research, soul search, research, soul search. What else you want to ask? You're so good. Well, you are a Hal Leonard published (laughs) author and you have a new book releasing soon. Yes. Can you you tell us about it? Thank you. You know, I left Hal Leonard, actually, if you could believe it, I left them. I started with them in 2011. That's when my book came out. And in 2015, I left because when you get a theatrical publication published, you only make 7.5% a book. Mm. And they say, you know, it makes you famous. So you don't make any money off the book, but it's the key in the door. And it did get me into the first, you know, 30 or 40 schools, but I was still peddling my wares like a door-to-door salesman. And I I don't know, there was something in me that was like, don't I deserve better than this? This is like a really, this is changing the game. It's not just like, hey, I'm writing a book on acting. Mm -hmm. I'm actually like going to be in the history books. So why am I peddling door-to-door 
and only making $7,000 after being with them for five years. So I, I asked them for my book back and they gave it back to me. And so I'm self-publishing this book. And in the meanwhile, in between when I left them and today, I created an online training program so that I could train universities, private voice teachers, that people could take classes from me wherever. So I built an online world in the meanwhile. So I actually kept it moving and grooving. But this book is actually, I'm keeping all my money. (laughs) And I'm going to use that money to build the coalition that I'm building, which is a place where we could have, where you could come into my training program and say, hey, I'm interested in taking these classes because these are the places I need to grow. And then I get to go, okay, great. Who do you want to advocate for? I know that you are non-disabled, but do you want to go to the theater that you grew up in and say, hey, you know, I love this place. And I'm noticing that you don't have any accessibility for anybody who might be disabled and actually in the show. Can I work with you to build a little dressing room over here or build a ramp over here? And by them, somebody doing volunteer work, they get to study with me on the cheap or free. Mm. So I'm creating an, a, a coalition of activism and artistry. Wow. Um, and that's what I'm going to do with the money that's going to come from the book. Yay. So if you want to buy the book, just know it's going to something amazing. <laughs> it's not just going in my pocket. It's going to make the world a better place. Yeah. That's so, so awesome. I'm self-publishing. Yeah. I love that they gave me my book back. I'm really glad. Yeah. I feel really lucky that I get to do this again in the way that best takes care of me and our community. That's great. Okay. So I am going to move on to my signature questions that I ask in every episode. Loved them. So what is some advice you would like to give to an aspiring young performer? Well, I mentioned this before, but I think that all performers, all artists should be in some form of counseling. Mm -hmm. And there's talk space, which is super cheap. Here in the city, there's like the National Institute for Psychotherapies, which is sliding scale. You know, the Gay and Lesbian Center, I think, has either sliding scale or free counseling. Like there are places that, that you can get counseling on the cheap, but we are putting ourselves on the line and putting ourselves out there in the world to be accepted or rejected. And on top of that, our cultural climate is, is, I think that we're all in a low grade depression. So why not just talk about your feelings and getting them out, get them out so that you can show up to the work a little bit freer, you know, a little more connected. That would be the advice that I would give. I think it is crucial. And I think that therapy and counseling and trauma therapy for me has been a game changer. Like I was, I was cool before. I'm way cooler now. (laughs) Way cooler after counseling. I think, I think uh, myself and many others would agree with how it has affected our lives. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I don't know what that stigma is. Like if you go to therapy, you're messed up. Um, No, I'm going to therapy. So I'm not as messed up. That's why I'm going. So I don't have to be that way anymore. Not because I am. It's like someone told me, you're so amazing. You should try therapy. And I was like, what? And then I was in therapy the next day. I was with somebody because I was like, somebody just told me that it's a, that it would make me more amazing. Not that I was a failure. Yeah. It's, it's re- reframing the language, right? Yeah. It's so important. That's my first, that, that's what I would say. Take care of yourself in that way. It's super important. Like if you're going to go to voice lessons and spend money on having voice lessons, why on earth wouldn't you spend money on your own mental wellness? Yeah. What is your favorite quote? <sighs> it's long. But I will tell you a little piece of it. I believe their name is Aldous Huxley. And I'm just going to read the, little, the first little bit. Okay. But it's about being in the world lightly. It's dark because you're trying too hard. Lightly, child. Lightly. Learn to do everything lightly. Yes, feel lightly, even though you're feeling deeply. Just lightly let things happen and lightly cope with them. This is a wonderful, wonderful quote. And it goes on. But I love that. In fact, I'm thinking about getting lightly child, lightly tattooed Mm -hmm. on my body facing outwards. So when people see it, they come to me lightly. And when I look in the mirror, (laughs) I know to go out in the world lightly. But I've always been so hard on myself Mm -hmm. and so critical on myself. and, and, And I've taken everything so heavily. And lightly, I think, is a great another great way to encourage people to be out in the world, just a little softer with everything. Mm. So everything comes to you a little softer, even the hard stuff. Yes. Lightly, child, lightly. I love it. Lightly, child, lightly. What are your favorite song lyrics? 
Um, the one I could think of right now is, is a Joni Mitchell lyric. Um, and I don't know why. I think I just use it oftentimes as an example of being a, a poetic lyric. Let's see. Um, but when he's gone, me and them lonesome blues collide. The bed's too big. The frying pan's too wide. Mm. Um, I think I think about that lyric and I think, oh, my God, the things I see and the things that, that I can imagine happen emotionally just from those lyrics to interpret. I think it's a good example of how a great lyric can mean anything to anybody. And we're all correct in our interpretations. Mm. Who influenced your teaching and or your performing the most? I don't know about teaching. I got to really think about that, though. I've had some really good teachers. Uh, my performing, I would say my biggest influence was came from a crucial time in my young adulthood, maybe about 16, 17 years old, where I somehow fell down a rabbit hole of, of videos of Bette Midler singing in like the early 70s. Mm. So watching Be a younger Bette Midler do live concerts and she's crying and screaming and off tune and making people laugh and kind of living as a full, wild, emotional creature. I watched a bunch of her concerts live at last. The Divine Miss M, Clams on the Half Shell, all of these old sort of early Bette Midler before she became more refined and sang like from a distance or Wind Beneath My Wings. <laughs> her wilder self was the person who influenced me the most to kind of come to things in my wilderness. Mm. So I would say she was probably as a holistic performer, my first influence, my most influential and first. Right. What is something new about the voice that you learned this week? <gasps> you know what? Um, I, I'd love to mention um, somebody who I interviewed for my book mm -hmm. that said something that, that I thought was a really, really cool way to say it. Um, he teaches, uh, his name is Jeff Ramsey, and he's been a backup singer for like all the great everybody. And he teaches R&B at Berklee School of Music. Mm. And we were talking about riffing, because that's what he teaches, right? And he said, he grew up in the church. And in these sort of like, I don't know, I guess I would say these Baptist churches, these old sort of like classic churches, where the singing was how God comes through, that they would use a term that if you are riffing to impress as opposed to express, mm. it is not anointing, meaning mm. it's selfish. It's not generous. He would even say it has no oil. So what he's doing it is he's bringing it back to classic the holiness of riffing, which is R&B, which comes from gospel and jazz and blues, which is one, black people, right? Mm -hmm. But two, it is the place in which they healed and lived and expressed just centuries of suffering, right? So if you're not going to, if you're going to riff because you listen to Sarah Bareilles and you copy her riffs or Adele's riffs, that is not anointing. Mm. Their anointing because they listened to black people, mm -hmm. so their music is anointing. But if you don't, if you don't listen to the people that they were listening to, and you don't go all the way back in time and listen to men and women that are black or male identified and female identified people that were black in the all the way back to to jazz and gospel and blues and everything that came after that, you know, which of course is Motown and then disco and then contemporary pop and R and B, hip hop. I mean, if you don't listen to the mother and the grandmother and the great grandmother. And you listen to the white friend, <laughs> it's not going to be anointing. And so that's why you cannot riff without understanding its roots and where it came from. So I love his quote about, are you expressing or are you impressing? What are you trying to do here? Because your job is to anoint. Your job is to have it be an emotional expression of release that is given as a gift to other people. Um, so to me, that was my favorite thing I heard about the voice is that it is, it needs to be a vessel through which you heal other people mm. in an act of generosity. Yeah. What is one item you could never live without? <sighs> my espresso machine. And that is a very <laughs> cheap answer. That's a no. cheap answer. All right. It's my go-go juice. Yes. 
espresso machine. It's my go-go juice. Mm. And I know it's so silly because people could be like, my crystals or like my <laughs> therapist, you know, like, but I'm like, if I don't have a double espresso, I'm worthless in the morning. You will not get an ounce of personality out of me. <laughs> Thank you, espresso machine. Thank you, Nespresso. <laughs> I wish I had a deeper answer, but that's really the truth. That's how my day starts. What is one thing that you have on your bucket list? <gasps> oh my goodness. Well, I'm starting to actually um, get it moving. But my a big part of my bucket list was to go to London and train the performers and teachers there. Mm. And I've already had friends over in London say, when are you coming over? So I think I'm going to go over for a couple of weeks just to introduce myself. And then I might kind of cross the pond for a year and go to London and then travel to different places once I'm over there because I've never traveled for pleasure. I've only traveled for business. Mm. And it's time for me to actually see the world and be influenced by other cultures um, in a way that has nothing to do with my teaching, but really has to do with me actually just learning about how other people do things in the world. Mm. So that's a bucket list item that is starting to very slowly manifest itself. Slowly. Yay. Yeah. Good, good, good. What is the most delightful word you can think of? Oh my God, effervescent. Ah. <laughs> or juicy. These are two words that I love using when I'm talking about acting or people's personalities or having your essence come through. Mm -hmm. Effervescent feels bubbling with or like crisp and delicious and refreshing and juicy is like rich and thick and yummy. These are the kind of things I want from voices, performers, people, effervescent and juicy. Great. And what is your favorite book? Um, it's not going to be nearly as fun as anybody else's books. Probably <laughs> I do a lot of audio books. Uh -huh. um, but there is a book that I was told to read when I was diagnosed with PTSD and it's called The Body Keeps the Score. Yes, such a good book. You know the book. Yes. Um, and I found that it took me out of thinking that I was having a singular experience mm. with the trauma that I had have experienced over my life. And I realized, wow, enough people have had it that someone actually studied it and somebody wrote a book about it. Yeah. <laughs> And I understood it on such a different level. So, you know, it's that body, emotion, mind, life relationship. I love it. I listen to it all. I listen to it and tap into it, you know, whenever I'm like, ah, oh, I got to get a, a friendly reminder of that. Um, and then if you don't mind my recommending, I mean, hopefully everybody's on the Brene Brown train, mm. but I happen to love the word wilderness as it is. And Her Braving the Wilderness is a fantastic book. Mm. But I love audiobooks. Awesome. What are you currently learning? Ooh, I'm learning a lot. <laughs> um, it's personal. I think it's a really, really cool personal thing to share. But I've always thought of myself as an artist who kept, I was mostly vulnerable and not totally vulnerable. Mm. People actually thought I was being vulnerable because I'm open. <laughs> but I was actually not being vulnerable. I was being open. And I'm learning that I've actually been hoarding my vulnerability. So that's a personal thing that I've been learning, which is that there's been, I've kept a 2% jar, uh, not a jar, but a 2% a, a car, a carton of milk's worth of my tears and my vulnerability to myself. Um, and I've not let anybody have it. And I, I'm just learning now that I have to give it over. Um, because that is a place where I have to lead from example as well. So yeah, I just learned that I've been hoarding my, I've been hoarding my vulnerability. What do you wish you would have learned sooner? <laughs> <laughs> what do I wish I would have learned sooner? Other than the fact that I have PTSD, I wish I would have learned that sooner. That it takes two hands to clap. And that whenever you're in any kind of a situation that's tricky, you have to remember that you're coming to it with your crap and the other person's coming to it with their crap. And I would say on the most part, if you can know that you, whatever is going on, don't ever say that it is your fault. Be responsible for your share. Whatever you can't claim or you don't have the ability to claim or is somebody else's, give that back over to them for their life to work out. But I would say only be responsible for what you are responsible for and everything else, you've got to give it over to the universe. 
If the listeners want to get in touch with you, Sherry, what is the best way that they can do that? Um, right now I'm spending most of my time on Instagram because it's a place where I don't have to see uh, the news or people's opinions about it. Mm -hmm. So I would say I kind of stay away from social media, but if people want to contact me and they're interested in like, they want to get a tour of the on-demand program or, you know, they, or there's somebody who's like, Hey Sherry, I have PTSD too. And I'm interested in what resources you have, or, you know, if there's anything that is not, what should I sing for this audition and wanting free advice um, Mm -hmm. on their audition process. I think sending me a private message on Instagram on my uh, rock the audition page, they'll get responded to pretty quick, quicker Mm -hmm. than an email, quicker than a Facebook message, because it's a way that I get to kind of see my friends lives and share my life and, and be able to isolate it to things that make me happy. Like, animal videos and get my friends' kids and inspirational things (laughs) and sharing. Oh, brilliant. Sherry, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today on the podcast. It was just such an honor to have you here. Well, I loved your questions and I'll say it before and I'll say it again. We are all very lucky to have you in our industry. You take very good care of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell your colleagues, your students, and your friends. Please subscribe, rate us, and write a review. You can find us on Facebook at Lifelight Massage. And you can also check out my website at lifelightmassage.com. Please join me next week for another wonderful conversation on The Visceral Voice.